John, before anything else, I want to say on behalf of KQED how much we value the work Thank that you, you do. Um, we are looking for deeper ways to collaborate with the Markla Center. We're working on a podcast, actually. Um, and Don and his team over the years, when it comes to the intersection of technology, ethics, and morality, they have been one of our go-to places. So I'm so grateful for the work that you and your team do. Thank you so much for those kind words. And I'm a grumpy old journalist, and so I, I've lived in the Bay Area for 18 months, <clears throat> and I'm a bit hypercritical of news media because of my background. And I want to <clears> say, um, and I was going to say this before you said those nice things, <laughs> that I consider KQED the gold standard for news in this area. Thank you. I really Thanks, I appreciate that. that. Thank you. <clears throat> so as you know, you may have noticed, we're living in an age where news and truth uh, might be in some jeopardy. And so my first question for you tonight, um, in your, especially in your new role as president of KQED, is in this age of fake news, some of it real fake news, some of it claimed fake news, in this age of, of so much misinformation, has that changed the mission uh, and the way you go about what you do at KQED? So, as a nonprofit, non commercial, independent media organization, we have a great mission. And that is simply to provide the most trusted, highest quality content where, when, how you need it. Um, but as you say, in an age of fake news and disinformation, um, clearly there's been an impact uh, on broadly speaking, trust in media. And if we're being honest, some of this is, some of this distrust is self-inflicted. Um, digital media has disrupted the business model. And commercial media in particular, they've been incentivized to really focus on scale and reach and eyeballs and ears and and so what we see is um, sensational headlines as opposed to context, um, as well as emotions over analysis. And one of the practical impacts is this decline in trust. And, and, and the thing that I worry about most in this moment in time is people getting news fatigue and just feeling powerless to have any kind of an impact on what's happening in the world. And Father O'Brien, you were talking about um, existential questions. And over the last couple of years at KQED, we've talked about not only our mission, which is a great mission, but what is the essence of our mission? What is our higher purpose? And we've come up with three very simple words, but I think they're very powerful words. And they are inform, inspire, and involve. And we pick those words because an informed, inspired, involved citizenry is the foundation of a healthy democracy and a strong community. So inform, you talked about our news. It's news coverage that's based on the highest principles of journalism, facts, accuracy, and that magic word you said, truth. Inspire, no matter what our coverage is, we don't just do the headlines or the breaking news and updates. We tell stories about human experience. And involve is all about, you know, trust is the most important asset we have. We want to leverage that trust so that people have a safe place, whether they're calling into forum or they're in our headquarters, there's a safe place so that they feel that they can be heard and that they can have civil dialogue and that they can participate in democracy. Because, by the way, democracy is not voting every four years. It's an ongoing thing, participation in society. So. Our mission is the same, but in this moment in time, our focus is, is pretty clearly defined, and it's who we are and what we stand for. Do you worry at all about the fragmentation of your audience, given the um, sort of fragmentation of America right now? Um, you know, I actually, as a general rule, I try not to worry about things that we can't control, um, although that's not true. I have an 18-year-old daughter who I don't control. I worry about her all the time. But, um, 
<laughs> setting that aside, I, I mean, you know, audience fragmentation is a reality, and it's important to understand why the audience is fragmented. And it's simply, um, the media environment right now, y you all know this, it's, there's an abundance of content and abundance of choice. Washington Post, The Guardian, they're doing great content. Then there's Netflix and Amazon Prime and YouTube. And then there are new players, new competitors, big, scary competitors, technology companies like Apple. And we talk about this all the time at KQED. It, Apple used to be about the computer, and then it, it's the iPod, and then it's the iPad, and now it's Apple Music and Apple News and Apple TV and Apple TV Plus, which, by the way, they provide original programming. So this is abundance of content, abundance of choice. Mm -hmm. So you all, because of this abundance and the opportunity with technology, it's impacting your behavior. And what we see is fairly obvious. Digital audiences are growing, 18 to 24-year-olds. They don't listen to live radio or watch live TV. They stream their content. So there's this changing behavior. And I mention that because it's not the fragmentation that I worry about, per se. It's really what we control. And what we control as a media organization is how we change to better serve our audience wants and needs. And in this world of abundance of content and choice, how we differentiate the work that we do from everything that's out there. And that all circles back to trust and quality content. Do you think, uh, as journalists, we have a responsibility to bring people together? Uh, I think in this moment in time, absolutely. And you just teed me up for something <laughs> that I need to lean in for a second. <laughs> because I was, I was just in DC a couple um, weeks ago. And in January of this, of 2020, PBS is going to celebrate their 50th anniversary. Mm. But it was 53 years ago that President Johnson, LBJ, signed the Public Broadcasting Act. When he signed that act, it established PBS, NPR, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. What he talked about is the vast wasteland of TV and the fact that media can be used for a force for good. And we have a competitive advantage at KQED is we have television, radio, and online. But we don't think about those things separately. I think there's an incredible opportunity to combine all forms of media, video, audio, and text, especially in this moment in time where a few talked about deep division and polarization. Critical, trusted information is more important than ever before because trusted quality media can stimulate curiosity, foster, understanding, build community. And so we're in the middle of a renovation of our building. And it's a stunningly beautiful building, amazing design. But the thing about the building is it's where everything comes together. Media, technology, journalism, and place where we can be more open and accessible to the community. And that's the heart of our new building is this place of trust where we can bring people together, not only connect with us, but connect with our journalists and our stories, but more importantly, connect with each other in this kind of forum so you can have civil, civic dialogue, maybe even spirited debate, but find common ground. So absolutely, we have a responsibility to bring people together because right now, the stuff that's out there is splitting people apart. And it is way too easy to say, oh, we're just divided, polarized, I'm just gonna stay over here. We gotta work at it to bring people together, and we play a role in doing that. I think you can see why we're so excited to be a content partner with KQED. Uh, one of my top goals when I arrived 18 months ago was to take the Markula Center, which is this gym. It's one of the largest, most comprehensive applied ethics centers in the world, and raise the awareness in the valley, across the country, internationally. And with partnerships like this one with KQED, I think we've got a good future ahead. Michael, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much.